Thank you, Tom, for the kind words. At the outset, I should acknowledge that this will be a very memorable day for me. And 15 years before, when I attended the first ISILS meeting as an international fellow in Marseille, France, little did I, even in the strangest dreams, I wouldn't have thought that the pride of wearing this medal which has been on the shoulders of giants in spine surgery would one day be mine. I should thank every one of the ISILS members across the international borders for bestowing the confidence and this honor on me. Now, we in ISILS always believe that we are a very unique organization, that our members are truly after science. And that is why we are not a society of spine surgery, but we are a society for the study of lumbar spine. And we emphasize so much on our inclusion criteria, and perhaps we are also one of the societies which have an exclusion criteria also, like a scientific study. And we need to demonstrate an interest in spine surgery continuously. So there is a lot of emphasis not only from us, but around the world on to continuously demonstrate this by publications and podium presentations. And in the last few years, there have been many incidences in our academic medicine life, in our place, which really have forced me to think, are we just little going overboard on publishing and emphasizing podium presentations? And is this corrupting science? Now, the buzzword in medicine is evidence-based medicine. And if you really think, what is evidence-based medicine? It is something that gets documented either as a published paper or which is presented in a podium in one of the well-recognized conferences. And the give, thing that gives sanctity to both of them is that whatever is being written or spoken is peer-reviewed. Now, I'm not sure at what period of time man got his first scientific thought and became a scientist. But the scientists of the early years were truly after the truth. When Galileo said that the Bible shows the way to go to heaven and not the way the heavens go, he actually risked his life for truth. When Thomas Alva Edison brought out the electric bulb, he said, I never perfected an invention that I did not think about in terms of service it might give to others. He did not think about patents and profit out of the electric bulb. And Einstein said, a person starts to live when he can live outside himself. Science should have meaningful when it works for the society. So it was not science which was for perfect. Similarly, the first published journals in 1665, if you look at why they were published, it just comes on the first page of that, giving some account of the present undertaking, studies, and labors of the engineers in many considerable parts of the world. So the publishing was as a molecular unit of research communication. But slowly, the dynasty of scholarly publication has taken other hues. It then became a measure of one's scientific excellence, then it became a basis for tenure and promotions. And then it also became a criteria for grants and salary funding. In fact, slowly it became a criteria for survival. And that's why this became, took a halo and the published papers became something very, very important in our life. But we really need to think. It actually started putting a pressure on scientists. Now in this publication in Nature, it has been very clearly shown that hiring decisions, tenure decisions, promotions, salary, performance reviews, and allocation of research, 70 to 80 percent of the decisions are decided by publications. As a result, scientists and us are becoming faceless. And I'm sure hereafter when we shake hands, we will say, hello, I am Dr. Raja, my H index is 31. And he'll say, I'm Keith, look, mine is 75. So, you know, then I say, okay, sir, you're the professor. So it's all going to do with metrics. And cartoons like this 
really did not mean cartoons. It was a reality. I mean, if you did not publish, then you perished. And this made a tremendous amount of pressure on publishing. So from 1665, the first published article, it took 1900 for the first million articles to be published. And it just took only 106 years for the next 4 million articles to be published. So you can see the curve is going very high. And this is also paralleled by the increase in number of first journal in 1665. In 2001, it was only 16,000 journals. But within the next 16 years, six years, we had almost uh, 7,750 journals coming up. And this is all based on the Ulrich database in publishing. So 5 million scholarly publications now. And this is a time that we need to introspect. Is it an explosion of science or just wasteful junk science? Now, one of the ways in which we can measure the value of an article is how much it is cited. And here, again, in this article in Nature, you can see that according to the information from the ISI, which we all respect, it indicates that 55% of papers published between 1981 and 85 were never cited thereafter at all. And if a similar trend holds that as much as 80% of papers published during that period have been cited not more than once. And what is more interesting is 15 to 20 percent of all citations is self-citation. So it just looks that if you go by the citation, it does not matter. Why does it happen? Because there are so many publications coming. Now in this article it says, this article was prompted because there was a professor who was a dean proudly listed 52 papers that he wrote in the course of the previous year. That means it is one idea conceived, executed, written, and published every week. Now, do you think this is possible? But it is possible, and people are doing, because there are lots of new science which is being created. The science of salami slicing. And you know, you also have new technologies and new terminologies coming, which is called the least publishable unit, or what is called the publon. Now, you know, the matter has been split into the smallest matter of atom, and atom is then split into electrons, neutrons, and protons. And now, one research work is split into publon. It is humorously defined as the elementary quantum of scientific research, which will enable you to get a publication. And publons are mutually repulsive, because the author never puts two publon into the same article. So you can never find more than one publon in one article. And the fingerprinting has confirmed that the same publon often appears in different conferences and different journals in different names. And it is very difficult to detect it because they defy deduction as they manifest itself with different keywords and captions and co-author variations on different occasions, thus defeating observations with even the most powerful database scanners. So you see, this is all becoming science. And you can also increase your number of publications by plagiarism. And you have to do it routinely and on a large scale. Because if you steal from one, your plagiarism, but if you steal from many people, it then becomes research. So it's all getting better and better. And the third thing you can do is to increase the number of co-authorship and publication parasitism, as it is put in Journal of Medical Ethics. Sometimes you need to have a co-author's party because many of them have never met each other before the publication and never meet even after the publication. So he says, welcome to the co-author party, you're number 21. So all these happens. Now, if you see it in contrast, Watson, who won a Nobel Prize along with Crick, had only 18 papers when he applied for the professorship in Harvard, in Boston. And one of the 18 papers was written five years earlier that gave him the Nobel Prize on, on DNA. But if you want to apply for a professorship in Harvard now, I think you'd need to have at least 600 papers. That's what the journal says. And how is it possible? And so that brings another question. Is this all wasteful avalanche of paper publication? And so scientists came with the idea, it should not be just the number of publications. You should put it a citation index. You should have an impact factor on the journal and a H index for an individual. 
Now your intention is to deceive, then people get over to deceive even on this. So now the impact fever, fever, people came to realize it is not just publication, but you should also citation. So there is a citation friends club. So people cite your friend and your friend cites for yourself. And the journal says there is a new criteria of citation disorders among scientists. The first one is called the self-citation mania. So the first paragraph of the article will have all the citations of the articles written by the same author. And I think it belongs to the philosophy. If you don't beat your own drums, who is going to beat it? Then you have the second idea, citation of friends and co-workers. And I think that belongs on the philosophy, you scratch my back, then I'll scratch your back. We also have selective citation amnesia and disregard syndrome when you don't want to cite some important work done by an other institution. And sometimes journals also join the game and solicit self-citation of the journal articles. So you see, if you want to manipulate, you can manipulate. And is citation index so sacred? Now this article in the JAMA, it says in a practical analysis, highly cited articles, it does not mean it is Bible. Because they found more than 44% of the articles with a high citation factor could not be replicated with similar results. So it all brings into, into the question. So when there is a mass of so much of publication, if you really go into the mass, you find 45% are never cited. Up to 34%, the only citation is self-citation. 80% are cited only once. 44% of papers in high index journals are not replicable. And 23% have loose statistics and self-serving methodologies. Now it just makes you wonder, is it wasteful science? But I think even this is okay. But there is another shade of gray to research, what do we call as the harmful science. And I think we have to look at all these things which are becoming more common. Questionable research practices, research misconduct, and even, unfortunately, frank frauds. Now let us look at a few examples. Now if you think I'm just talking as a devil's advocate, exaggerating the facts, now look at this article which says, how many scientists fabricate and falsify research? A systematic review and meta-analysis of server data. Ten years before, if somebody had told me that there is going to be a meta-analysis of scientific fraud, we would have thought that it's not possible. But here it is, and the results are more shocking. This is an anonymous study where they had asked three questions. Have you falsified data? Do you know of a co-research worker who falsifies data? Are you aware of a major scientific fraud? And guess what? 5% of the respondents said they have involved or they have just modified some data to get a better p fact value or something. And the 17% average, but up to 60% said that they know of colleagues who commit, commit questionable research practices, and 39%, and up to a high of 80% said they know of case bias and frank frauds. Now, this looks really astonishing, isn't it? So it is not just one study. Here it is listed all the studies that have dealt with this scientific fraud. And here you can see that all of them are self-reporting and anonymously, and 15% acceptance in self, and up to 60% knowledge in others. Now this is called the Muhammad Ali phenomenon. I am superior than thou, but still, there is something, even if you average both of these, that means there is 30% problem. Another important BMJ article, are these data real? Statistical methods for detection of data fabrication of clinical trials. You first get articles in few decades before how to good, get good statistics, and now you get articles as statistics of how to detect statistics fraud. And they found that two clinical trials in cardiovascular diseases, several statistical features were strongly suggestive of data fabrication because they were so wrong that no other explanation was possible. Now, if this is the state in publication, 
we really need to be worried about what they call as the gray signs because what is being presented on the podium and there are lots of article which quotes up to 30 to 40 percent falsification of data adjustment of data data improvement to make look better to make your p-value little better so that your acceptance rates better and if we think of a big meeting like spine week and if you think that 30 percent of podium presentations have some form of data management now i think that is something which we really need to be really worried about so many different parts of this is fine now that is the problem of publish or perish now unfortunately the last 10 years we have another problem publish to flourish and i think that we need to be really careful about this because with a little lie you can make your lie look more stronger more good if you just add a p value to your lie and if you all think that the most favorite sport for scientists is golf no you're wrong it actually looks like it's playing with statistics is the more important thing now just few examples <clears throat> just the nasi trial one two and three which advocated use of methylprednisolone in spinal cord injury and it became almost the dictum that you should use and in the few years that it was on more than a billion dollar profit to Pfizer and later every one of the study on this actually proves that they are not correct the studies were a hoax three clinical trials six cohort study 12 larger animal publications were studied and they say that this is no good now what was the problem numbers tables figures and statistics scant and inconsistently defined even professional statisticians statisticians unable to duplicate what was given as the true values in the tablet columns there has been no public validation of the results and unfortunately i am not sure that whether the problem of all the above is because that it was industry founded probably is because one of the principal investigators and proponent of methylprednisolone michael bracken was a well paid consultant of pfizer earlier as pharmacia received lot of lecture fees from pfizer for promoting solumedrol and received a fee for every lecture that he gave internationally and also received a large financial support from pfizer for a program in pharmacoepidemiology that he was directing now is that the basis on which the faulty statistics was there we don't know but looks like now the color of the research seems to often be the shades of green and when this gets involved i think it's easy for us to get uh, sidetracked the other important thing where published to flourish works very well is in ghost writing industry nowadays talks to the world through the tongue and writes with the hands of famous medical men now this is something that is really shocking when you read now again in this article the haunting of medical journals by ghost writers how how ghost writing sold hrt hormone replacement therapy to everybody they are very clearly shown how pharmaceutical companies pay professional writers to produce evidence not to write but to produce evidence in papers and then pay other scientists or physicians to attach their names to these papers before they are published in medical or scientific journals now they employed why <clears throat> the company employed a, another company called design right and the aim and the objective of design right an important part of its work for wyeth was to manage authors and journals there is evidence in unsealed documents they have shown this is a busy slide but what it has categorically said is that they designed of planned messages it was agreed in the board room that what will be the message of the uh, uh, articles and how the experts from the published article actually reflected over there without any scientific basis now for each of the article that appeared design right was given us dollars 25000 and each of the subsidiary reports that came out of it design right was given $15000 altogether $280000 was given to design right to do that 
And then the whistleblowers came from New York Times when they found that many of the authors who had penned these and who had published were not even aware of the exact details of the articles that was published under their name. And these articles has promoted HRT all around the world and more than 2,500 cases of uterine carcinoma and breast carcinoma could be attributed to the high dose of HRT. Now there is one thing that we need to think about in this. Did the medical men did not know about this? And why it has to be always the New York Times that has to blow the visit? Now I would come to this again over here. Now if you think ghost authorship happens only very, uh, it doesn't happen frequently. Now look at this study. This was done by three JAMA editors, Annette Flanagan, Fontanosa, and Catherine DeAngelis. I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing properly, but they are very respected editors of JAMA. And this was been reported in New York Times, that the result was that ghost authorship rates was 16.2% in New England Journal of Medicine, which we all think is a gold standard. 15.3 in Annals of Internal Medicine and 7.1 in their own journal, JAMA. Now, this is really very, very wondering. And Lemons, when he wrote about this, he said he considered this as a prostitution of their academic standing. And he lamented that medical journals, academic institutions, and professional societies pay scant attention in enforcing effective sanctions and thereby there should be an imposition of legal liability on guest authors and may give rise to claims that could be pursued in a class action based on racketeer-influenced and corruption organizations over here. Now, two issues to this. Number one, why don't medical men report whenever they have a suspicion of something going wrong? Why it has to be always New York Times or Wall Street Journal who brings it out? And third, if we don't police ourselves, there are going to be some very strict policing from outside, and then we are going to make a big problem. The problem is now we have a huge number of research magicians who give whatever data which is required by the pharmaceutical companies. Now, this is a very important uh, uh, study. I'm sure that all of you have heard about it, where a researcher, Scott Rubin, published 18 important papers in high-impact journals and there was only one problem in his study. Later it was found that no patients were ever enrolled in any of his study and all of them were written in his dining table. Not his study table, it was a dining table because all of them were cooked. Perhaps these people are all behaving like science chefs. The three studies on Celebrex, Bextra and Vioxx involved a huge profit and marketing for Pfizer again. And he was paid 420,000 as consultant fees and another donation to a trust he manages. And for all of these, 18 published articles in high impact journals and found out only many years later. Now, they all look like research magicians. Whatever the pharma company wants, they say abracadabra, let there be evidence and data. And Sham, immediately the research data appears on their computer from thin air. But what is more important is it gets into a peer-reviewed paper, gets turned into evidence, and also frequently to FDA approvals. Now, that is really desliting evidence-based medicine. Wherever science was lacking, they filled up the magic of the gap and the vehicle by which they transformed fabrication into evidence was by getting published into a peer-reviewed paper journal. So this is something that all of us have to be very, very worried about. But the main problem is how do we know which studies are real and which ones are false? For example, Scott Rubin, 13 years later only we could find and by the time all the three drugs have sold by millions around the world. There is one last thing before I want to finish. When healing goes beyond all this, and then when healing really actually becomes a crime. And we really need to be worried about that. In the prize-winning book, Pulitzer Prize-winning book, The Emperor of All Maladies, there is an entire chapter on this. The stamp regimen, which was a mega-dose radiation therapy for breast cancer, 
was suddenly hit the limelight when the author reported a 90% success and then throughout the world people said the dose limiting barrier in cancer has been overcome published in American Journal of Clinical Oncology with a high impact factor and there they reported eight and a half years follow-up 60% survival in trial patients and 20% survival in controls was such a huge difference that in eight years at least 30,000 American women had undergone the procedure each at a cost of hundred thousand to four hundred thousand dollars each in the initial studies at least 10% to 20% of the women died as a result of the very high dose and its complications what was very worrying was that many patients developed highly aggressive chemotherapy resistant acute myeloid leukemia this is really bad and again this keeps coming again this was the whistleblowers were Times medical writers not fellow oncologists not fellow doctors and when this came in the paper everybody said yeah I knew it before itself I suspected it well, I thought it is like that I was also wondering that this is a very wrong statistics but no medical person took the courage to make sure that wrong things were not done for the patients after it came in Times in 2001 the American Society instituted a committee and then they found that this was completely wrong and the entire data was fraudulent and fabricated against that they found that the actual protocol was written nine years after the study was begun just when they got ready to publish they started writing the protocol and there were many many things that were wrong and all the publications were withdrawn and so you know many patients developed all these problems and what we lost here was not the war on cancer but along with it the confidence of the patients now two important books I think all of us must read the betrayers of truth fraud and deceit in the halls of science and then the one by Robert Park on voodoo science where many instances are given where big published papers in high impact journals advocated treatment for billions that were spent on worthless therapies the tax dollars that were squandered but voodoo science actually has a chapter which says the, the greatest cost is human because there is they increase the fear of imaginary dangers reliance on wrong cures and most importantly a mistaken view of how the world works well if you all agree that science is in pursuit of truth and in pursuit of knowledge of how the world works when these papers really kill the whole purpose of science so it is obvious that amongst the scientific community there are Dr. Jekylls and Dr. H Mr. Hyde's and perhaps even within each one of the scientists there is a little bit of Dr. Jekyll because you know when the meta-analysis came five to seven percent of people said well I cheat a little I will just sometimes improve my results to get the p-value but I don't change the hypothesis or results but there are others who do all the way fraud now the whole question is that is it just one rotten apple or is it the tip of the iceberg and we are failing to see what is underneath I think the above statistics clearly show if you go down deep there are many many rotten apples which all all the one thing that is very certain is every research paper on scientific fraud consistently comes with the approximate data of 30 percent falsification of data that is one in three papers or one in three podium presentations which means that we really need to think where are we going so to conclude what should we do I think the first thing that is very obvious is that the peer review process is under great strain there are so many journals coming up all the time publication pressure is increasing the article submission tremendously and editors are suffering from getting good peers and if that quality at that point we lose then the quality of peer-reviewed papers come down and then the whole quality goes into it. there is a total breakdown of peer-reviewed process so as has been told in this article in nature in 2011 the published peer-reviewed paper is not sacred anymore
This has great implications for science. Now, because we know when we talk of uh, evidence-based medicine, we put all our money into the raw data, which is the fundamental. Out of the raw data, we get peer publications and presentations. And many people bring out review articles and meta-analysis based on these publications. And then the evidence is built over which we put the citadel, the crown of evidence-based medicine. Now, if even in the best journals, 30 to 40 percent of the raw data is wrong, there is also one more important uh, uh, article, which I have not put it as a slide here, that in the British Medical Journal, BMJ, in a period of time, they asked all the important articles to submit their raw data. And believe what? 48% of the article authors wanted their papers to be withdrawn because they could not give the raw data. Now, if the raw data is not there, then peer publication and the review articles and meta-analysis is hoax, then the evidence is gone, and then that gives a spin to the evidence-based medicine, and then it goes off. So we all know this in the bottom of our heart, but how are we going to act on the solution? Now, there are many soft solutions available, like whenever you ask for a CV, you don't ask for how many publications do you have, but only say, give your top five publications and what it is worth. We also agree that the system of rewards must change. Libraries must stop subscription to low-quality journals. Professorships must not be self-funding. Otherwise, the professor spends all his time writing for grant proposals, and a large chunk of his time goes into from grant writing to grant writing and grant proposal. Very little time they have for teaching or to be a role model in research in that department. And we have to recognize the phenomenon of overpublication. But more importantly, we have to go into basic of what makes people cheat, what makes national heroes turn into victims and to be criminals uh, next day. When you go into literature, three things are obvious. Firstly, scientific cheating is not a new phenomenon. It's an age-old human habit. Now, there is a very good article on this which says, Perhaps Gregor Mendel, when he put up his Mendelian laws, there was a little bit of data management over there. I mean, his laws are perfect. All his principles are perfect. But the perfect ratios of 3 is to 1 and 9 is to 2 that he always bought has never been reproduced in any other form of replication. So they say probably he improved his data, but his philosophy was correct. Another example of plagiarism is Dr. Louis Pasteur, who did a wonderful work. He used the bacterial strain of one of his colleagues for inoculation, but sadly did not acknowledge his contribution when he wrote the paper or got the award. And books like this actually say the huge number of plagiarism and cheating in other scientific articles in different fields also like the electrons charge or the discovery of cold fusion or the controversial discovery of element 118. Now, all these are mustered in great controversy. So it is a general phenomenon. I think it's a general phenomenon of society that when you are put under pressure, people tend to cheat. I think if you put them under a lot of stress, stress of survival will promote cheating and fraudulent behavior. So we need to look into, I think the elders of the society here people who are in academic positions, people who are in the helm of affairs of judging, employing, and people must look into it. Now, this is exactly told in Lewis Carroll. Now, you see here in the real life, you have to really run twice as fast, and still you find that you are staying in the same place. So if you want promotions, you really need to work harder than that. And that is what our chairman of Infosys, Narayana Murthy, said. If you have an academic culture, that encourages rat race, you should not be very surprised if at the end of 10 years everybody behaves like a rat. I think that is very, very uh, important. So these things must really actually change. Now these are things important because in the next few years there are going to be so many journals that we are going to be inundated by data. And what is going to be the uh, easels and other societies? Now we really need to ask this question. Should all the fake papers or research fraud be exposed by these societies or 
the policing of science should be handed over to these organizations. I think we should take it up on ourselves. Otherwise, we are on the phenomenon of emperor and his clothes, where we all know that there is a problem, but we are not able to acknowledge it. We have sadly not been able to bring the morality that is very common in golf. Because when a golfer is in the wood, all alone, nobody is seeing him, he doesn't kick his ball into an open spot. He knows that nobody else would know, but he would know that he cheated and the results were a lie. And true golfers will understand that they enter and leave the field with a clear conscience, either that or they would not be playing at all. So if that is true for golf, then I think that it should have been true for science also. Before I close, I would like to bring this quote of Mahatma Gandhiji, the father of our nation, when he was asked, what are all the seven deadly sins? Then he said, wealth without work, profit without conscience, science without humanity, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, politics or science without principle, and worship without sacrifice. Now, these are the things that he said will bring a society down. And if you look at it, many of these things discusses about what we have discussed in the last half an hour. I would think that ISILS, which is one of the premier scientific societies in the world, which is close to our heart, we all take pride in it. I think we teach a lot of research methodology, but we also should think how we should promote research morality around the world. I am sure that this can be done if all of us put our minds together. Thank you again for your attention. And let me again say that it's one of the honors and pride in my professional career to have delivered the presidential oration to you today. Thank you very much.